Well, we are going to continue um, our series in Mark next week. We're going to be in chapter 5 of Mark, but this week we're going to kind of time out from Mark because of Christmas Eve coming up tomorrow. Wanted to let you know that we have two Christmas Eve services tomorrow night at 5 and 7 o'clock, each of them an hour long. Same service, just different options based on whatever your schedule is or your family time. And tomorrow marks what will be our 13th annual Christmas Eve offering. How many of you know we've been doing this for 12 years? 12 Christmas Eve offerings. Tomorrow will be our 13th. And those of you who are new to Mac, these offerings in the last 12 years have been used prayerfully. We just, as God leads, this money has been used to meet practical needs in our community as a demonstration of God's love for people. And just so that you have some idea where we've been with this, this was fascinating to me, and I honestly had to do research to figure this stuff out. But nine years ago, the offering nine years ago helped us launch, anybody, any guesses? Mac Garage. That's right. Helped us launch the Mac Garage. Now, for those of you who don't know, that is the building on the east side of our building, and that is a mechanic shop that offers free auto maintenance for single parents. And so do you realize that for the last nine years, this offering that we are receiving tomorrow night has funded and supported that ministry so that people can have help with their vehicles when they can't afford oil changes or whatever those other things are. And that is headed up, by the way, by Patty Barnett. The year before the Matt Garage, we received an offering and gave that money to Franklin School to use specifically to meet the needs of needy families in their school, parents who couldn't buy their kids gloves in winter or boots. And so that money was used for them. And I actually remember hearing about that offering before we were even at Mac. It was creating buzz in the community. A church gave an offering to a public school. In 2010, we added two more schools to that list. Chief Charlotte, which is right next door to us up the hill here, and Meadow Hill. And so those schools, again, have been part of the offering every year since 2010, and that's included, we go in and make lattes for the teachers to bless them. The first year we received the offering, we gave gift cards to every teacher and staff member in those three schools. And the idea for those gift cards, which were to eat out or to go shopping, was to say, we love you, we notice you, we're thankful for what you do for our kids. Do you agree with that? Yeah. Amen. Yeah, this, this, is, this is meant to be an exciting remembrance, a time of remembrance of look at what God has done for his glory as we have been able to demonstrate love. In 2013, the offering expanded to be able to begin meeting the needs of people at the Grandview Apartments. It's an apartment complex just up the hill from us. And um, that is overseen by uh, Debbie Drapes along with her public school outreach. But I wanted to just let you know some things that happened this year at the Grandview Apartments. There were 10, we gave 10 different move-in baskets to the Grandview Apartments, meaning there were at least 10 people who moved into the apartments and as you know, you get into a place and you realize, oh my goodness, I don't have this or I need to probably clean that. And so these baskets had sort of move in stuff for these people to say, welcome, welcome to the neighborhood. There were also five new baby baskets that we gave, which means there were at least five new babies born at the Grandview Apartments or two families of the Grandview Apartments this year, maybe at the Grandview Apartments, I don't know. Um, but that has been such a, an encouraging thing to be able to do that. People have reached out to us and said, hey, I, need, I don't have any furniture. Do you have anything? And we've come up with couches and beds and all kinds of stuff to bless those people and, and be a good neighbor to those people. In most recent years, two more, uh, we have added foster care and adoption to these offerings. And what this is, is overseen by Laura Wildebor. The point of this is to support and encourage families that are stepping out and saying, I want to be a part of providing a home for children. I want to be a part of foster care, or I'm interested in moving in the direction of adoption. Mac has an amazing ministry, um, and an amazing, all of these ministries have amazing groups of volunteers, the body that has stepped up to, to do this work. And this foster, I want to just tell you a couple of things, very encouraging. Every single month we have a foster dinner, which is an amazing free dinner for people who come, they bring and there's child care for their foster kids. They can come and eat this dinner. There's a special speaker, a, a professional, somebody who speaks on a particular topic related to the stuff that you encounter in foster care or adoption. 
And it's just an awesome way to um, network and connect with people. And I just want to tell you, there are 125 people in attendance at these dinners each, each month. 125 people that would come to these dinners and are connecting with each other, are finding support. And I can just tell you from being at these that the people who walk through the doors, a lot of times they look like they're underwater. <laughs> like they just got a baby last night at 2 a.m. and they don't even know where to start. Um, just telling you how big of a, of a blessing that is to families. But fo- the foster closet is an extension of that, and that is something that Renee Nielsen has just like totally dominated. If you ever want to go see that room, uh, you walk into the room and it's like you're transported to a palace somewhere. But it's this beautiful room with all of these uh, things. And last year we had 180 people come to the foster closet for clothes, for cribs, for things that they received a kid and realized, I don't have anything for a you know, a a one-month-old or a new baby, and they come to the foster closet, they get what they need. Um, And so it's such, you know, and the reason I'm telling you guys this is the stuff you don't hear about, is it? Some of you know, but some of you are like, I I, I had no clue. Last year, we added our final line in our Christmas Eve budget to support and to help our Congolese friends, people who have been taken away from their homes and are refugees in Missoula, and there are currently 11 different Congolese families at MAC, 45 people that are here with us each Sunday. And uh, so many different things that take place, different events to help them connect with each other. When I come here on Wednesday nights, I'm part of Awana because I have a bunch of kids, um, and so I'm here. But um, I also also notice in, in the um, office area that there's multiple people that are tutoring a group of Congolese in English. They're teaching English to our uh, families that are here and um, Mark Bradford, one of our elders, is meeting with the guys once a week to disciple them, just to talk about the sermon, to say, hey, what did you hear in there? And here's a key word. What does it mean to be forgiven? And so that is just so amazing to me. I, I love that. Can we just, just like say thank you, God? And, and all of our volunteers that are stepping up every day that don't get recognized, um, thank you. Tomorrow night, um, we are receiving our Christmas Eve offering, and you're going to see a slideshow during the offering, if you're here, of videos and pictures of things that have happened this last year, sort of expounding on this list that's up on the screen. But this offering, for this offering, we're trusting God for $40,000. Every time I say that, I said that last year, and in my mind, I'm like, oh my goodness, that's way too much. And you guys gave, I think, $49,000. And so I am so encouraged by this. And the reason I'm sharing all this is just to give you a picture of how much this offering has expanded over the last 12 years. And I think the reason is very simple. The needs have grown. And or we have become more aware of the needs that have been here all along. And so this offering is um, a way that we minister, we care for people, we show them the love of God. And so I want to just invite you to pray about giving. Um, You can either give while you're here or you can give online. But for this morning, now moving into our time in the Word, I want to take some time this morning to talk about why we are continuing to do this offering. And why are we giving to these five areas, Macarage, foster care, Grandview Apartments, Congolese families, and public schools? Why are we doing this? And I think that's a valid question because there's multiple answers for why you keep doing things that you do in the church. Here's a great one. We've always done it. Anybody heard that? Yeah. We've always done it. It's a tradition. Why would we stop? Don't stop. That's, that's our tradition. That's not why we do it. Another reason is that, well, we just don't have anything else to put money toward. I guess it might as well be those five things. <laughs> that's not it. It's certainly not so that we can make a name for Mac in the community. It's not so people will think, wow, Mac, what a neat church you are. It's not that. The reason, in my opinion, we are doing this is what I'm going to explain here in our time in the Word. So, if you would, open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 22. I want to direct your attention to the seat backs in front of you. If you don't have a Bible, you can grab one of those, keep that Bible. And I love it that we can have a Bible open or turned on if it's on your phone or something, because that is God's Word. Not just some history, but it is God's word to us, and he is still speaking today. I have people come up every week and say, and and this is an awesome compliment, Micah, God spoke to me today, and it didn't have much to do with what you were saying. (laughs) 
more or less. You know, they're like, I, God had me on something that, that I was just, he, he wouldn't let me stop focusing on. So I, I love that. God is here. God is speaking. And in Matthew chapter 22, verse 35, the context here is that the Pharisees are gathered around Jesus, which we've been familiar with in the Gospel of Mark, and we're going to continue next week with that. But they're gathered around Jesus, and there's this lawyer among them who asks Jesus a question. Lawyer. I have a hard time with that. By the way, my wife and I argue about how to say that word. I say liar because it's law. And then there's a year at the end. Anybody? Please? Is there anybody? Thank you. I want to. I see that hand. Hallelujah. Okay. I, but apparently my wife's like, it's not liar, liar. It's lawyer. So that's what I'm going to say for today, just because I think that's the majority where people are at. So verse 35, Matthew 22, 35. That was a way to set up our time in the Word. <laughs> One of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And he said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. That's all we're going to read from Matthew. We're going to turn over to Luke in a second. But first, I just want us to look at this fascinating exchange. This lawyer who is not like a a John Grisham thriller kind of a lawyer that just argues people's cases. He is literally an expert in religious law. He, He is known for knowing the law, and he comes to Jesus and he says, Jesus, which is the most important law? In other words, if I were going to get rid of everything else and just forget about the rest of it and only focus on one thing, what would you say? I thought about it this week. Jesus could have responded in a variety of ways. He could have said, thou shalt have no other gods before me. It's a big one. He could have said, thou shalt not murder. That would be nice if that were done with, right? What does he say, though? He says, you shall love the Lord your God with, for this morning we'll just say, everything you are. With your affections, with your being, with your intellect, with your abilities, everything because this is the greatest commandment. And then it's funny, Jesus just sort of piggybacks on that. He keeps going even though the lawyer didn't ask. He says, here's the second one, there's a second one too, that's like the first. Love your neighbor as yourself. And we see why Jesus gives this answer. He says, because on these two depend, or literally the word there is, are suspended all the law and the prophets. Meaning, That you could open up the Bible and any encouragement or exhortation or scripture you find, put your finger down, it can all be summed up right here. Love God and love your neighbor as yourself. You ever think about that? That actually sums up the Ten Commandments very well if you were to read through those. Loving God and then it gets into don't lie, don't steal, don't murder, because that's not really loving your neighbor very well, right? All of it is summed up right here. And in Matthew 22, where we read this morning, you keep going, and it looks like the conversation stops. But it doesn't. It keeps going. There's more to the conversation. Matthew just doesn't record this. So, at this point, please turn forward to Luke, chapter 10. Luke 10, verse 29. And we're going to find out what happens after the lawyer asks this question to Jesus. What's the greatest commandment? After Jesus answers the question, here's the greatest and... The second, Luke 10, 29, it'll be up on the screen as well, says, but he, this is the lawyer, wanting to justify himself, said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? I think it is very shocking and fascinating that he says nothing about the first commandment. (laughs) As if like, I've got that one figured out. I can love the Lord my God with everything, which is crazy because none of us can. But he had ways to manage that. I think in his mind, he's like, that's why we do sacrifices. That's why we go to the temple. Where that's, that's the God part. What bugs him is the second. Love my neighbor as myself. Yes, Jesus, but who is my neighbor? And I actually think this sort of reveals how good of a lawyer he was because in this place, he's actually trying to get off on a technicality, I think. <laughs> Who is my neighbor, Jesus? Is it the guy next door to me? 
And, and, and do I also have to consider the guy on this? Because that's two neighbors. And actually, Jesus, I live on a really big lot, so I don't even know if I have neighbors. They're all kind of like out there a little bit. Anybody relate to that? Huh. He's kind of trying to weasel out, and Jesus replies in verse 30 with a story, a parable. A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. This was a notoriously dangerous road, by the way. You always traveled it with other people, never alone. And he fell among robbers who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down that road and he saw him and he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was and when he saw him, he had compassion. Notice these three different people see this need. The first two respond the same way. And these two guys, the priest and the Levite, a priest, as you may already know, a priest, his job was to be in the temple. He was offering sacrifices. That was his responsibility. And so he was in ministry, so to speak, if you want to think of it that way. Maybe a modern day version would be a pastor or, or a, you know, something like that, a bishop. And so this priest was a, a minister, was doing God's work. A Levite is very similar, very related to the priest because the Levite's job was basically administrative. It was to keep the temple clean. It was to make sure the utensils were ready. It was to make sure the doors were open and closed at the right time so that the priest could do his job and offer sacrifices. So here's this priest and this Levite, both men employed in the house of God, ministry profession, And the great irony is that on this particular day, they totally miss a glaring need for ministry. And not only did they pass by this man, Jesus says what? They passed by on the other side. Like, get as far away from that guy as possible. Yuck. Bloody. Ugh. Ugh. I'm going to get by on the other side. I got to get by as fast as possible. Now, we don't know their motives. We don't know why they kept going exactly, but I think some of us can probably guess because I think some of us have probably had similar excuses before. And I'm just going to share a few that came to my mind that I've had before. I've got to get home. Anybody? I'm late. I've got to get home. Or how about this? I don't know the first thing about first aid. I don't, I don't know. That, that's way beyond my pay grade. I didn't get my CPR license renewed, so I'm going to just kind of keep moving, right? Or maybe instead of that, so I'll just pray somebody will come help him. It's not always the wrong answer, but maybe that's what they were thinking. Or maybe they thought this, he shouldn't have been alone on such a dangerous road. He should have known better. He brought this on himself. I think that's a common thought when we see people in need. Here's an excuse that is probably, honestly, the most relatable for me. I've got to get to the temple and perform my service for the Lord irony, isn't it? So these important religious people passed by this ministry opportunity. And it's at this point in the story that I think the Levite and uh, the, rather the lawyer and the, and, the, and the Pharisees that were gathered around asking this question probably related really well to the priest and to the Levite. And they probably maybe even agreed with their decision to keep going. You're going to offer sacrifices to God. That's a noble and a holy thing. You don't go get your clothes bloody. And so I could see them relating, and it's at this point in the story Jesus introduces a third character who is a Samaritan. Now I'll just point out that as this reference came out of Jesus' mouth, it probably would have been received as close to profanity to these Jews because Samaritans were half-breed nothings. They were enemies The Samaritans and the Jews hated each other. And so Jesus brings this in. And this is very important that Jesus uses the Samaritan because the Jews believed, did you know, that you should love your neighbor. They believed that completely. But you know what they also believed? You are allowed and entitled to hate your enemy. We know that they believe that because Jesus in Matthew 5, what does he say? You have heard it said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. You know why they'd heard it said? Because that's what they were taught. And so it makes complete sense that this lawyer would be asking the question, who is my neighbor? 
That was a valid question because he's basically saying, Jesus, if you can just define for me who I am required to love, then I will do that. And that also then will clarify who I'm allowed to hate and avoid. And so it is fascinating and sort of funny that Jesus places the Samaritan, the enemy of the Jews, as the hero in this story. This person that they would have said, I, I, I can love my neighbor, but, but those people, they have a different religion, they have different, um, perhaps, race, different preferences, different political persuasion. Anybody ringing bells? I don't have to love them the same way. I don't have to love them the same way as I love my family or I love my friends. So Jesus purposely inserts this Samaritan, this person that the Jews saw as being so far away from God, is the one who does God's will in the story. And I want to just take a minute and look at what this Samaritan does, which is very beautiful. Look at verse 34. He went to the man who had been beaten and robbed, and he bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii. That denarii, by the way, is a uh, day's wage. And so this is two days worth of work for this man. He paid, took it out, gave it to the innkeeper and said, take care of him and whatever more you spend, I will repay when I come back. Then Jesus turned to the lawyer after the story and asked, which of these do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? He said, the one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, you go and do likewise. That's such a beautiful story. I, I've heard that story growing up to the point where I kind of like, yeah, no, nah, you know, I already know that one. And then I just thought about it this week and I pictured it. It's so beautiful. And I think one of the most beautiful things about it, honestly, is that the lawyer gets the point. How many times does Jesus tell a parable and people go, oh, what, bread, you know? And the lawyer here, he understands it. As hard as it would be for a Jewish lawyer, an expert in Jewish law, to admit he, the Samaritan, was the one who did God's will there. And Jesus is like, you got it. And if you look at, by the way, the other gospels, the account, Jesus in one place says, you are not far from the kingdom of God. You got it. Now go. And do likewise. And I want to just take a minute right now and examine, look at this, to, to talk about what this Samaritan actually did, because I think this is what will show us practically what it means to love our neighbor as ourself. Because that's what he does. And that's, here's what it means. First of all, notice this. The Samaritan was aware of the need. If you want to take notes, you can do that on the back of your Mac Life. There's three A's and a fourth at the very end. Bonus, Okay. <laughs> The first is that the Samaritan was aware of the need. And I think that's worth noting, even though it seems sort of obvious, he wasn't too busy. He wasn't looking at his phone, right? <laughs> There's a jab for us 2018 people, including me, right? He, he, he was aware, he noticed the need, but then you, you might also say, well, so did the priest and the Levite. What made him different? The second thing he did, he made himself available to meet the need. And I think it would be naive to assume that this man had nowhere to be and had nothing to do. As if he just wandered around the streets finding people to help. Maybe, but probably not. And we know that because in, after he stays at the inn with him, he has to leave. He's like, I'll come back later. He has places to be, but he makes himself available to meet the need. And you know what? I think there's one key word in this passage that compels him to make himself available. Do you know what it is? Yes, compassion. That word literally means to be moved. He felt something. It bothered him to see that man lying there in that state. It bothered him. It affected him. He thought, I, there's no way I'll be able to sleep tonight if I walk past that. He was affected by compassion. He was moved. And, and notice, I want you to just notice this. What made this man a good neighbor is that he was aware of the need and he made himself available for the need right in front of him. You know, growing up, I always understood these verses to mean Jesus is saying by the end, the point is that everyone is my neighbor. That's what I grew up believing. Now, who feels overwhelmed? <laughs> 
I, like, I was like, oh, where do I start? But I don't think that's the point Jesus is making. In fact, he's actually narrowing it down. And he's saying there's a need in front of you. Are, are you aware of it? And are you going to make yourself available to meet it? This one need. You see, I think sometimes we, we are overwhelmed with the statistical magnitude of the needs. Like when I hear that there are 140 million orphans in the world. That's terrible. But at the same time, what do, what do I do about that? Those 140 million? I don't know. When I hear that there's 9 out of 10 people in Missoula who don't have a church, who don't hear the gospel, I think, oh my goodness, but what do I do about that? But if you put one person in front of me who is hungry to know more about Jesus, <laughs> I can do something with that. You know, I asked my wife and my family's permission to share this, but we um, adopted a couple years ago siblings from Bozeman. A little girl, a little boy, and we love them, and we love our kids. But I, I wanted to just sort of confess to you that I had no intention of adopting. I didn't have a burden for the, the, the orphan. I didn't have this strong desire to adopt. We weren't browsing the list of names or the countries, none of that. But when I heard through the orchestrating of God's will, what he, which is what he does, when I heard that there was a brother and sister that would go into the foster system if they didn't have a home, it was not a choice. It was literally a no-brainer. And it didn't matter if we had enough money or space or food or whatever. It was like they either go into the foster care system or we give them a home. It was easy. And all of a sudden that 140 million became really practical. And I think that is the point that Jesus is making in his do you know of a need, and, and are you willing to do anything about that need? The last thing, though, that I see this man doing is he makes abundant provision for the need. I had so much fun thinking about this this week. First of all, notice what he does for this, what appears to be a total stranger. He binds up his wounds. Now, translation, we don't really say, I'm going to bind up your wounds. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop the bleeding. How about that? I'm going to stop the bleeding so you don't die. Now, that would have been amazing if he had just gone over, wrapped up this guy's wounds, and gone to his appointments. But he didn't stop there, did he? It says he put wine on the wound, which was to disinfect it. And then he put oil on the wound, which just to soothe the pain, which probably was caused by the wine. You know how that goes. <laughs> and so he's disinfecting the wound, and, and he's soothing the pain of this wound. And that would have been amazing if he had just done that and moved on. But he doesn't. He then puts this man, this bloody man, up on his animal, presumably where he would normally be sitting, and walks this man back into town, takes him to an inn, apparently stays the night with this man to make sure he's okay. Because it says the next day, he gets up and he gives the innkeeper more money to keep him there, and then, this is the pinnacle of abundance, I think, Verse 35, and whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. <laughs> How many of you have ever received a blank check? Anyone? I haven't. That would be awesome. But that's what this is. It's a blank check. Whatever more you spend, whatever it takes to get this man healthy, whatever, however long it takes until he's ready to go back to his family, I'll cover it. It's amazing. By the way, what a beautiful picture of the gospel, isn't it? Because when I see situations like this, how much of the time are we just sort of inwardly calculating? Do they deserve my help? How did they get into that place? Maybe, maybe they brought this on themselves. I don't, I don't know. I don't think. I, and we're calculating. And even just the question, Jesus, who is my neighbor? <laughs> reveals a desire to have a version of love that is limited and calculating. And the interesting thing is that Jesus, God's love, is famously uncalculating. It doesn't dice up the affections and say, here's a piece for you and a piece for you, and here's a little for you and a little for you. Think of Jesus who is walking up the hill to die, carrying his cross. And do you think that he was surveying the crowd and thinking, I wonder who really appreciates what I'm doing here? 
or somebody spits in his face, do you think he thought, no forgiveness for you? He wasn't calculating, he wasn't measuring it out. He was pouring out everything, even for his enemies. That's the gospel. That is the picture that we have. And friends, that I think is the point of the Christmas Eve offering is that we're, we're aware of the need. We can't say we're not. And we're, we're making ourselves available to meet the need and, and hopefully providing abundantly for the need. And when we do this, guys, three things before we close. When we do this, this is what happens. Number one, we are putting God's love on display. I love 1 John 4.10. This is love. You want to know what love is? The world's like, what is love? You know, I think there's a baby don't hurt me. That's, why did I bring that up? That's such a chintzy song. But kind of true, you know? It's like, what is love? It just feels like pain. What is love? This is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us (laughs) and sent his son to be the sacrifice for our sins. See, this is not about Mac. This is not about Christmas Eve or $40,000. This is about the love of God who would give his own son to be sacrificed for his enemies. That is why we do this, is to put that kind of love on display. You think about Romans chapter 8 where it says, God did not spare even his own son, but freely delivered him up for us all. How will he not also with him freely give us all things? In other words, that's the blank check. <laughs> I'm going to do whatever it takes to bring these people back to me. And then he did. And I want to just take a quick head count or hand count right now. Who likes to be loved that way? Go ahead. It'll feel good to raise your hand. Yeah. That's why Jesus doesn't just say, hey, love your neighbor. What's he say? Love your neighbor as yourself. Because the reality is if you were beaten up and robbed and naked and thrown on the side of the road, what would you want someone to do for you? If you had a spouse abandon you in Montana in the winter and leave you with your kids, and you had to go get an extra job to put food in their mouth, and then your car broke down, what would you want someone to do for you? If you were uprooted from your country and taken to another place where there was a foreign language and foreign customs and everything was crazy and you didn't even know where to start, what would you want people to do for you? See, when we love this way, we put God's love on display. And more than that, I want to say, number two, we are loving God himself when we do this. This is worship to God. And I think of of the verse in 1 John 4 that says, If uh, if someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? See, this is fascinating because it seems that Jesus is offering two answers to the lawyer's one question, but in reality, I think it's one answer. Because it is impossible to love God if we don't love our neighbor. That's what the Bible says. And it is proof that we really love God when we love our neighbor as ourself. The last thing, when we love this way, we are following Jesus. Jesus said this, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do and greater works. So, so when we see Jesus caring for people, when we see him healing the hurting, taking time to spend time with his enemies even, forgiving and 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 reaching out to people that's what we are called to do and greater and more and i I read a very convicting quote this week it says if it was normal for jesus it should be normal for us that's a simple and challenging way to think about what it means to follow christ but one thing that i wanted to insert here that i'm struck by the way jesus loved people and this is a challenge. This is something that I've just, I'm praying about. And I want to invite you to join me. Jesus never separated the works from the word. You notice Jesus never had any interest in just coming and fixing people's temporary problems so that one day they could go to a life separated from God. That's not what Jesus came for. He came to restore people to the wholeness for which they were created, which included... Not just time, 
Not just talents, not just treasure, which our offering represents, but what? The truth about who God is, about what he has done for them, that he gave his only son to bring them back to him. And so I just am faced with the challenge, and I know that many of you have felt this, is how do we be good neighbors to public schools and to our foster care system while also being good followers of Jesus Christ? And I think the answer, we're going to get to the answer, the answer is that we stay close to Jesus and we seek his heart and we're available and we say, Jesus, I know what they ultimately need, but I want to do it in a way that walks through an available door that you've opened. And so I just want to ask, would you pray with me about that this coming year? Yes? No? Thank you. (laughs) I'm serious because I want that, but I also am not going to just create some program where we go and start passing out flyers. I want it to be the body of Christ who is compelled and has the opportunity to share the love of Christ with people. The works and the word. Pray about that with me. But finally, as we close, I want to just add one more thing. I gave you three A's earlier, right? Be aware of the need. Make yourself available to meet the need. And then be abundant in your provision. Be generous. But if that is where we stopped, what we would have is a very nice religion. Be more like the Good Samaritan. But let me tell you, that is, as noble as it sounds, that is not the gospel. The gospel starts with the fact that we can't. The gospel starts with the fact that I cannot love the Lord my God with everything I am. I'm too selfish. I cannot love my neighbor as myself because I'm too busy loving myself. That's the reality. That's the, go- the gospel starts with the fact that Jesus died for our failure to do what God requires us to do. Amen? Amen. Now, that doesn't feel nice to say out loud, but that is the reality. But in his death, the reason he died is so that the righteous requirements of his perfect commands could be fully met in us who have Christ in us. Christ, who fulfilled the law, is our righteousness. We're not trying to become the good Samaritan. Jesus is the good Samaritan. We're the dude by the side of the road. That is the gospel. And so I want to close with one more A this morning that ties all of this together. And if this is the only thing you remember, this is what you take with you. Number four, we must abide. Now you can just sigh. Breathe, everybody. Go ahead. It's not about you. Abide in me, Jesus said, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. See, we can't do this. <laughs> we can't love God the way he deserves. We can't love our neighbors ourselves without Christ in us. Jesus goes on in these beautiful words. He says, by this, in verse eight, my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. That's a great key verse for the Good Samaritan. If you say you love me, if you say you're a Christian, there should be some proof. But it is absolutely significant in the next verse how Jesus says we will arrive at fruitfulness. Verse 9, as the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Say these last four words with me. Abide in my love. It's not about me, it is not about Mac, it's not about money, it is about the love of God filling us and flowing through us to meet the needs of the people who are so desperate for him. Time, talent, treasure, the truth, whatever it is that God opens the door, that is what it is about. Friends, this is what our offering is about. Being aware of those needs, being available providing abundantly, but then recognizing, oh my goodness, if we don't abide in Christ, none of it happens. None of it. I want to invite Stephanie up to close us with a song. But as she's coming and and gets ready, I want to have us watch a short little video, which is actually two people kind of saying thank you. They're foster families. And, And the reason why we asked for some videos, if anybody has anything they want to send, and we received several, um, and we're only showing two this morning, But I I kind of think hypothetically, 
if that man who had been beaten and robbed could ever connect up with the Samaritan. I wonder if they ever ran into each other again and he could tell him what it meant to him, what that Samaritan did. So I think it's important to be able to hear recognizing God is the one who receives all the glory for what he has done. It's good for you guys to hear what God has done through your giving. So let's watch this video and then we'll close. My name is Seven Hobbs and I'd like to express that the Missoula Alliance Church has been one of the most tremendous helps to my family and I, other families in this community, and they've truly done God's work. The things that they've been able to do, like the foster programs that they put out, the meetings, the dinners once a month, the closet. I mean, my two-year-old to my 17-year-old have benefited from clothes in that closet. The dinners have been amazing to be able to network with other people in the same position as I am as a foster parent. Just the overall camaraderie and and connection and and love that we receive every time we go there has just been amazing. Mac Church is what we call it, is an amazing, amazing place and their organization within is, is truly a godsend. Hi, my name is Katie, and my husband Matt and I are foster parents here at MAC. And we've been coming to the MAC support group and the dinner uh, about once a month for two years now. Um, And it's just been such a huge help to have this group and this um, ability to be able to connect with other foster families and parents who get it and are in the same boat as us. And... This fall especially was um, really important for us to have this ministry that Mac does. Um, We just had a pretty hard time. We had to say goodbye to one of our foster babies who we'd had for 18 months or more. Um, And we just had a really hard time and Mac was there. Like I had phone calls and texts and... um, flowers delivered and meals delivered and uh, as we walked through just an incredibly hard season um, Mac was there to support us through it and um, just having other families that came alongside of us that we had met at the foster dinners um, was incredible support so I'm so so grateful for Mac and the ministry that they do to foster families. Um, It's just been everything that we've needed in this season. So thank you.